Canto 21 of The Purgatory marks a distinctive shift. I think it's the first time in the whole of the Divine Comedy that we're not just told about life in paradise, but through Dante's genius as a poet, start to get direct glimpses, felt experiences even, of that life. It marks a shift too because it's in Canto 21 that one of the big co-stars of the Divine Comedy appears and he brings a shift in the sense that the two figures of Dante and Virgil are joined by him and so the two become three and that's really important because in the qualitative approach to numbers, as opposed to treating numbers just as quantitative parts of the world. The move from two to three marks a really important emergence of the dynamic that really makes for transformation. If you like, when you have just two, you have exchange, you have camaraderie, you have the guide leading the soul on as Virgil has been leading Dante. But when three appears, a new dimension of life appears too, and in particular it's the dimension that makes for radical transformation, not just continuing along the way that you've always known, even though the way you've always known might well take you to new terrains, to new landscapes. It's only when the two becomes three, that it becomes possible to really get what you might call the takeoff, the rise into a new domain altogether. Three, if you like, is the number of dynamic change. Of course, it's associated with the three of the Trinity in the Christian understanding of the divine as well. And that one of those Trinitarian aspects is precisely um, the creativity of God, that if you like, the Father and the Son give birth to the Spirit between them, or if you like, the Spirit is what gives birth to the relationship between the Father and the Son, um, it can work both ways, um, and that is both a new relationship but also a new kind of experience of reality. This is also key to understanding the poem and it's going to become explicit in paradise. It's already been quite implicit now. But this is how, for Dante, the pilgrim, Dante, the poet, can use figures like Virgil to stand both for a kind of part or element or aspect of the divine story. But at the same time, those individuals can know the whole of the divine story too. So Virgil stands for the soul before this dynamic of transformation, if you like, before the tropological moment that enables them to rise to the anagogic perspective, to the divine perspective. Um, remember, we've had these different layers of reading, the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, which is the turning point that leads to the anagogic, to the truly divine perspective. Well, Virgil has in part been standing for that pre-tropological, that pre-converted soul. You know, it's been stressed that he is a pagan soul. Um, he feels like he's uh, missed out and is trapped in eternal hell, although I think that has also been shown to be changing as he comes through purgatory with Dante. And that's possible because Virgil stands both for the soul who was created naturally but before divine grace appeared in the world, that's in terms of the history of the evolution of consciousness, um, the period before the Christian dispensation and then after the Christ Christian dispensation. Um, you know, Virgil's born a pagan, but from the point of view of the anagogic perspective, the view of God, which is gained by we souls after our own conversion, after, if you like, grace has perfected that created nature. Virgil can be seen to know God fully, to be enjoying the paradisal view as well. Um, I think that that is what his unfolding in Purgatory is really about. But Dante too is undergoing 
his own transformation. He, if you like, stands for the part of us that is born with the divine future ahead of us, the anagogic view ahead of us. So a future that is going to be transformed by grace, but needs to come to know that. Um, and know that in particularly, not just doctrinally, not just because it's what we've read, what we've been told, um, because as it were, we live after the moment in world consciousness marked by the emergence of Christianity in particular, but he must also get to know it directly so that it actually fills his being consciously um, so that his will has willed what is promised, so that his love has taken in what has um, what's going to become the anagogic view, um, so that his sight has been made capable of that which is lies ahead of him as well. Um, so he too has got his own transformation to undergo. Um, and so Virgil and Dante um, are working together. They're, if you like, a sort of divine double, um, uh, a twin um, of the soul moving towards conversion from both perspectives, both from the, the future that's promised, but also from the past that must move up as well. And this particularly comes into perspective in this canto because of the appearance of the third shade, who, to cut to the chase, it turns out has just undergone the moment when these two sides of our divine journey come together, when the transformation is complete. Though just because it's complete in itself doesn't mean that the, that's the end of the journey either, because as we will see both actually here, but particularly when we get into paradise, there's still lots more for souls to grow into, even when they know that they're in the state of grace, that they're in the divine presence. Um, one of the things I think that's lovely about the divine comedy is that nothing stops in heaven because heaven is itself a dynamic place. It is the place of the original dynamism, much as the Trinitarian view of the divine is the place of the original exchange, perichoresis, um, the movement between Father, Son in the Spirit. So there's a lot going on in this move from two to three, from two-ness to three-ness, from the dual aspect experience of reality into the Trinitarian, the three-dimensional view that takes off, that rises up into whole new dimensions, symbolised here by Virgil and Dante being joined by a third shade. But before we get to that, the canto itself opens where Canto 20 had finished off with Dante, Dante's thirst and desire for more increasingly intensifying. They're still stepping through the souls of the avaricious who are mourning the way that they've been held, they'd held themselves back in life. Um, there's a, a, a tremendous build up here um, which again is, is psychologically so profound um, because it's precisely what happens before the tropological moment, before there's a sudden sense of moving into new reality, uh, an awareness just arises. You know, this is attested to in all accounts of spiritual transformation. And Dante, the poet, himself signals this dynamic because even as Dante the Pilgrim and Virgil are stepping between the bodies, feeling that this is all they can do, where else can they go? How long must they undergo this forging ahead? All of a sudden, and lo, the text says, a third soul appears behind them. Now Dante makes a kind of naive remark that this was a bit like Christ appearing to the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus another moment in the biblical story where two becomes three and a radical transformation of perspective becomes possible as a result. But he kind of makes it here in the comedy in a naive way, much as in fact the story on the road to Emmaus had seen the third appear, Christ appear beside the two disciples without the two disciples knowing what had happened. And Dante himself now in purgatory takes quite a time to realise just what has happened. But it's anticipated, even in the moment of the sudden appearing of the third, and then of the way that the new shade makes himself known to the two. 
because he greets them um, and he greets them using the words of the peace, uh, may the peace of God be with you. And Dante, the poet, describes Virgil as responding appropriately. Now he doesn't explicitly tell us what Virgil does. Um, I think because he's still keeping Virgil in this in-between state of the soul who is finding out that in spite of everything they thought they knew about their eternal condemnation, they're on the way to salvation. So I think Virgil, it isn't said explicitly what he does, but it's said that he gives the appropriate response to may God be with you, which is the kiss of peace. Now this is hugely significant because this is a sharing of the breath in the kiss. The people who exchange the kiss of peace become conspirators. Um, they share the same breath, um, which is to share the same spirit, which is precisely to share the spirit of peace, which is to share in the peace of God. So, you know, the kiss of peace is not just a nice way to greet someone. It is theologically heavily pregnant with meaning. And because it's about saying together we share in the divine spirit. So Virgil is doing sort of far more than he knows as well, even as Dante is saying, oh, it was a bit like on the road to Emmaus, is saying far more than he knows as well too. And the new shades then have a bit of a discussion. Um, the, the new shade, by the way, hasn't revealed who they are yet, um, so hence I'm trying uh, to keep to that as well. Um, you know, trying to capture these tropical moments of revelation is really important in the poem because um, then we feel the shift, the opening inside us. But anyway, Virgil and the Shade have a conversation. Virgil says, may you know the peace that I don't know because of my original condemnation. And the Shade says, well, how come you're both here then, you know, high up the mountain? because it's only with God's blessing, with God's grace, that people can climb this far. And Virgil then explains that he is the guide to Dante, who's still a living soul. Um, they're on the side of the mountain, away from the sun, so the new shade can't see Dante's shadow, and so know that he's still living. Um, that Virgil actually says to the shade, um, you would know that he is living because of the marks on his forehead, the peas that the angel had put there. Um, and it's quite a nice little detail because, in a way, Virgil knows something that the new shade doesn't. Um, the new shade also um, knows things about the mountain and so on, as we'll find out, um, that Virgil and Dante don't. So, in a way, this group of three now are all on a journey towards the divine. Um, that doesn't mean that they all know exactly the same. They're all at the same time pursuing their own individual quests and so know certain things and don't know others. But as is the way in purgatory, the souls are increasingly willing to share what they know and out of a generosity of spirit, knowing that they're all in this together and can help and assist each other, which is what goes on now between Dante Virgil and the New Shade. Dante the poet actually takes this opportunity to bring in another three to kind of underline the theme of threeness in the canto, I think, because when he says that Dante is living, he talks about the three muses that give mortal life in traditional mythology. So there's one muse that measures out the thread of life, there's a second muse that weaves the thread into the life, and then there's a third muse that cuts the thread. And Dante, sorry, Virgil um, uses that metaphor here. Um, it seems quite a long-winded way to say he's still alive, but he, as it were, is unconsciously himself being moved by the Trinitarian quality of the place, even as he speaks. I think that's why he does it. Virgil then asks the new shade about the meaning of the earthquake, this tremendous event that they'd heard echoing down the mountain, um, even as souls started singing glory to God in the highest. Um, what was that all about? Um, Dante is hugely relieved that Virgil has put the question directly. Um, he incidentally has described this yearning to know more inside him as akin to the yearning which the woman by the well in Samaria had asked for the eternal water 
that quenches thirst forever. If you remember the biblical encounter between the woman at the well in Samaria and Jesus, she'd been drawing water out of the well. Jesus has said, I can give you water uh, which will last into eternity. And she had said, you know, give me this eternal life. And it gets, it's interesting because it says something about this dynamic of grace and change. Um, it's described in the Bible by Jesus as an eternal fountain welling up within you from which you can perpetually drink and quench your thirst. Um, so the source um, of the divine can be within you, if you like, and yet it takes time to learn to drink from it, um, which is what happens, well, here on, I think, in purgatory, but also particularly in paradise. Um, the souls there know that the divine light, rather than divine water, um, is all around them, but they must learn to take it in and become aligned with it more and more. Anyway, the shade does explain about the earthquake and tells them that what happens is that the souls who are on Mount Purgatory are there because they will it. Um, they realise that they have got to work through the deeper, darkest parts of themselves in order that all of themselves can become capable of divine life, um, that their microcosm, if you like, inside can become the perfect receptacle for the macrocosm of the divine cosmos in its entirety. And they can feel, even as they're suffering on Mount Purgatory, how they're gradually being cleansed, being changed, becoming more and more capable. And that's what keeps them at it. That's what keeps them struggling and wrestling with pride, with, with anger and with um, avariciousness, as we've just seen. And that's what makes the difference when you're on Mount Purgatory. But all of a sudden, a moment comes when they realise that they've done it, um, that their will has now become capable of being aligned to the divine will without impediment anymore. And in that moment, they stand up. And also in that moment, the mountain itself quakes and celebrates the instant. I think because the whole purpose of this place is precisely to facilitate souls on that journey. So it celebrates in all its being, it jumps for joy, and the effect is an earthquake. The mountain itself cooperates with divine grace and so facilitates these tropological moments with the souls who are on it. And the weather that you experience on Mount Purgatory is therefore of this spiritual or supernatural quality, unlike, the shade explains, the weather on earth that um, obeys different rules, um, more natural um, qualities. Um, though I think the implication is that um, if we, even whilst we're on earth, become more attuned to the spiritual dynamics in life, we can see and feel how even the natural world cooperates with divine grace. And so people have synchronicities, they see things which look supernatural, um, and that aspect of divine life can filter down even off Mount Purgatory, as it were, into this world. Then the shade explains that it was actually his own standing up that caused the mountain to rejoice, that precipitated the earthquake in that moment. He had just reached that moment where his will had become aligned with the divine will. He explains he's been on Mount Purgatory for many hundreds of years. And Dante is absolutely delighted at this. I think that in that moment, Dante himself experiences directly something of what the conversion is really about. You know, it's not just about the dual extending, developing, um, reaching out to more understanding, um, which he's experienced with Virgil thus far. Um, he sees with his own eyes what it's like when this sudden leap up takes place, this conversion happens, and it completely delights him. If you like, he sees inside himself the eternal fountain and starts to really believe and know that he can drink from it as well. This you know, promises something really wonderful um, as they continue on their journey, though it's still going to be very hard and difficult at times. And then the shade reveals who he actually is. Um, he says that he is Statius, 
and Statius was a first century pagan poet. And that is quite remarkable in itself because we've got a pagan here, high up Mount Purgatory, who has been described by Dante the poet as appearing behind them like Christ appeared on the road to Emmaus. Um, this pagan poet also knows a huge amount about the way that Mount Purgatory works precisely because he has experienced its work. He now knows of divine grace unimpeded because of his experience and time in this place. Now that, what that means, the pagan Statius having reached salvation, is going to be explored um, in further cantos. Here now in the canto, we've got the three made explicit. We've got the pre-transformed in Virgil, we've got the transforming in Dante, and we've got the transformed in Statius. Statius then explains something about his own pre-transformed life um, when he was on earth, and he says basically that everything that he knew as a poet, any talents that he himself had, any sort of fire or spirit as a poet that was within him, was learnt from the great poet Virgil. He doesn't yet know that Virgil has stood before him, that he would be prepared to spend another year on Mount Purgatory if only he could have lived a life that knew Virgil back on earth. Now at this point Dante can barely contain himself he looks to Virgil and Virgil in his silence conveys to Dante to remain silent and I think what this is about is Virgil maintaining this humble stance he's in the process of being transformed as well and doesn't want to to flirt with the pride um, that having this great fan of his stood before him um, might precipitate and so would prefer to remain incognito but Statius has seen the glance between Virgil and Dante and there's a very lovely moment where as it were smiles break out um, in the three of them as it's then revealed that standing before Statius is actually Virgil himself. Um, it's the fulfilment of the kiss of peace if you like that happened at the beginning of the canto. Um, they are now quite literally all conspirators sharing the same spit of the same spirit um, in their joy um, of recognizing who they all are Statius, Virgil and Dante. Statius then falls um, towards Virgil uh, wanting to give him a hug um, and Virgil says no um, Statius don't hug me now um, in a way there's no need for that greeting I think this implies because they all know that they're already collaborators, conspirators, sharing the divine spirit, the divine peace. Um, so there's no need for the, the external sign of that, which the kiss of peace of course is. They know it directly themselves, at least in this moment of revelation, this moment um, of sudden realization, which of course is what the tropological experience is all about. But even in this lovely, divine, almost paradisal moment between the three of them, because they've become three, Statius says to Virgil, no, you're right. I shouldn't reach out to you as if I've got an earthly body, because my emptiness now is ready to be filled up with divine life, to absorb a whole new reality. And that is the direction in which we're headed. It's a lovely end to the canto. Um, a very human end, which at one level has been about the joyful meeting of three souls, but has also been about divine activity as the two becomes three and a dramatic transformation becomes possible. But also Statius recognising that this is just in a way making him ready to drink more fully from the eternal fountain. And that drinking, that learning, that exploration and extension of direct experience is going to continue right away in the next canto.